Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. On our project uh, at Spell and Bird. Uh, it's an exciting project. Uh, the project team is here uh, tonight uh, to give you a little idea of what to expect uh, you know, as far as the plans to go for the indoor aquatic center. Um, I would caution a little bit just in that uh, the plans, while pretty far along after visiting with you know, our architect and TSP, uh, our uh, pool consultants, our citizen uh, committee, our construction manager, uh, and then also um, just being able to pull all this stuff together uh, to be able to share with the community uh, what, what our plans are for the new indoor aquatic center. Uh, we've taken preliminary concepts uh, that we used uh, over the last um, several months and now uh, actually getting, getting them to the point where uh, we can actually start to visualize what the project will look like. Uh, here with us tonight is uh, Sean Urban. Sean is with TSB Architects. Uh, he is uh, leading uh, the project management uh, side of it for TSP. Uh, Tony Wiseman is also with Sioux Falls Construction. Uh, Tony is our construction manager at risk, and so he'll be presenting some items uh, tonight as well. And then we also have Chad Cucker. Chad is with Confluence. Confluence is a landscape architecture firm, and they were really working on the site portion uh, of this particular project. So uh, with that, i turn it over to Sean after he's all mic'd up, and uh, take it away, Sean. Okay, thanks, Don. Uh, Sean Urban with TSP. Uh, today we're going to present a number of things about this project. Uh, we're going to start with the pools and some of the aspects that will be included within the, uh, the various designs of the pool areas themselves. Then we'll move on to the building and some of the concepts you'll see there. And then we'll move on to site, uh, where Chad will speak to some of those things regarding the site and landscape and those kinds of things. And then we'll wrap up with some of the commentary about the construction and what the neighborhood can expect. So to start off, uh, the Indoor Aquatic Center at Spellerberg Park is the official name of the project. Um, first, we're going to talk a little bit about the rec pool. Uh, in general, this is about three foot six inches deep. Uh, you'll notice to the upper right side where you see this curve, that's a zero depth entry. So those of you that may not know what that is, that's basically a beach that starts off from the same height of the uh, floor slab and then tapers down to be three foot six deep once you get far enough into the pool. That's great for the younger children and other kids that want to use that as well as people that may not want to use a, a series of steps or a ladder because they can just walk right into the water and uh, enter it that way. Uh, that particular pool will be kept likely between 84 and 86 degrees. It'll be about uh, 5,739 square feet and will hold about 109,496 gallons. Uh, it will have sprays around the perimeter. You can see these little dots. It's a series of sprays and things that are kind of fun to walk through uh, for kids. And then a 15 foot water slide on the upper left there that drops from about 15 feet above the floor slab down into the pool. And then you can see this kind of figure eight shape. That's a current channel. And that has two ways of getting into it, both uh, from the three foot six <coughs> in the pool, as well as from a stair that you can see in the left side there. And these are a couple of images that are similar type facilities. This, ours will not be colored quite like this. There will be some other variances, but it kind of gives you a feel for the type of space we're talking about. Lots of glass. Next is the therapy pool. Uh, that'll be kept about 88 to 90 degrees. Uh, it'll have 38, let's see, 1,500 square feet and 38,696 gallons. Uh, it also has a zero depth entry ramp. You can see that here. So you come down the ramp, you'll turn, you'll come down the rest of the ramp, and then that comes down to that therapy pool, and that gets as deep as five feet deep. Uh, and we did hear from the citizens committee that suggested we make that a little bit deeper, and so uh, Park and Rec took that under advisement, and we revised uh, to respond to that. And there's a couple of images of what this type of a facility would look like. Ours will be a little bit different than this, of course. And then the lap pool. Uh, that's an area that 
uh, will be kept at between 78 degrees and 82 degrees. Uh, it's 12,932 square feet of water area and 820,213 gallons. So it's a big pool, eight tenths of a million gallons in that. Uh, it'll have tw 10 lanes that you can see shown there going east to west, or 21 lanes if you swim in the short direction of the pool. So lots of flexibility for the city so they can use it for whether it's uh, maybe a swim team practice or a scuba uh, class or uh, water aerobics or maybe uh, synchronized swimming classes. Uh, you'll see these two gray areas on the right side. Those are bulkheads. Now, if you don't know what a bulkhead is, that's basically a floating wall that can move throughout that pool and it can divide the pool into multiple areas so that it can be used for multiple things all at the same time. The nice thing about those is that allows, uh, they, they will have sockets to be able to put in diving blocks so that you can actually compete off of those blocks or you can leave those out of there and use it just as separate bodies of water for different functions. Okay. Uh, let's see, there are also shown, you can see on the right side here, four diving boards. There's a pair here and a pair here. The top, the two toward the top side are actually three meter, uh, yeah, three meter diving boards. So they'll be just short of 10 feet off of the water. And the ones on the bottom are one meter diving boards. So they'll be a little bit past three feet off of the water. The spray ground will be just outside the rec pool. There's a, what a competition pool looks like. You can see uh, these are bulkheads shown there, so you can kind of see what that movable wall will look like. The spray ground, uh, which is currently on an alternate, uh, is 2,500 square feet, has seven water sprays, and has uh, both surface features as well as high profile features. Uh, the intent there is to have kind of a variety of spaces that are actually outdoors. An indoor pool, you want to be able to, during the summer, when people want to get outside to enjoy a little bit of uh, spray from the water and those kinds of things, can enjoy this spray park area, which is adjacent to a pair of sunning decks that allow people to sit in the sun on that beautiful day. And there's kind of a, a look of what these look like. Currently we have this style of a rainbow uh, in the set, as well as that hoop there that drops water so you can actually walk under it. Moving on to the building, um, this is the main level floor plan that we're currently working with. You can see this is very similar to the earlier presentation given to the public with the uh, lap pool toward the north side is actually nestled into the hill. Uh, to decrease its apparent height. Uh, the rec pool is kept on the south side to get maximum light into the space. We wanted that to be bright and cheerful throughout the whole year and having lots of windows helped us to get there. Uh, we also wanted to be sure that our sun deck, which needs to be on the south side, has good views from the interior of the building since uh, the lifeguards will be patrolling all of those areas. Uh, and let's see, the entry is on the south side here. You'll see that again in the site plan as we show that. Uh, the entry has direct access to the front of the building and a drop-off area uh, from the people that are driving to drop off kids or groups or whatever it might be. And you'll see there's a pair of restrooms just inside that so that those can be accessible to people using the sledding hill. So for the first time, people out there sledding can actually come inside the building, use the restroom, and go right back out and enjoy that nice feature of this park. So moving farther in, this is a small office area. Again, this plan is really compact and efficient. We tried to make every use of every square foot that we could. And so this is a pretty small area, but it's just what, uh, the, what the park and rec needs. And then there's a small area here for concessions. Uh, they will have a limited menu uh, that hasn't been entirely determined, but uh, it's fairly flexible to allow for a lot of different things to happen in that space. And as we move farther into the plan here, you see this zone here 
is a series of men's and women's locker rooms, or boys and girls too. And then a little bit farther to the north of that, you can see here, there's four family changing rooms. So if, uh, if a man comes with his uh, wife that needs some assistance in changing into a swimsuit, they can do that. Or a man comes with his two daughters, they can handle changing and getting ready for a nice swim. So that's what the family changing room does. It allows that flexibility in how you use the space. And then we also made a separate entrance here uh, for a, uh, a meet entrance for the competition pool. For those occasional times where we have a larger event in the facility, uh, Park and Rec felt it was really important not to have to shut down the rest of the center just for a special event like that. So we have a separate entrance so that those people coming for that event can go right <coughs> into a dedicated entrance just for that event. And then you can see here, here and here are a couple of spaces that are multi-purpose areas so that uh, Park and Rec can rent those out for whether it's birthday parties or other events like that that give them some flexibility in the kinds of smaller things that they can post in this space. And here's kind of a 3D popped up angled view of that, uh, that floor plan. Helps you to picture a little bit more what the spaces are like and how they're separated as you look through them. You can see the deep end is to the right side of that, uh, that lap pool. And you can see this separating wall that helps to define that zero depth entry area for the little kids and the play structure that will be in there from the little bit deeper part that has uh, 20 meter, 20 yard lap lanes within that pool as well. And here's a mezzanine level floor plan. And you might say, why do we need a two story uh, facility for uh, an aquatic center like this? Well, the answer to that is when we do have an event there, you've got to be able to see what you're uh, watching. And to have seating down on the deck limits the ability to see the entire pool. So this mezzanine level actually brings up some space for uh, 500 spectator okay. seats. And you'll notice those recesses at the back side here, those are for handicapped uh, spots. So somebody in a wheelchair uh, could bring their, uh, their person that they want to bring with them and sit right next to them and watch a swim meet. That will be a pretty new thing for Sioux Falls too. And then you'll notice this flat area behind is actually designed to have um, tables and chairs or other flexible space. And as families sit in those spaces, they can listen and watch what's going on with a, with whether it's a swim meet or somebody swimming laps or a <coughs> synchronized swimming class or whatever it might be. Or they can watch what's going on in the rec pool too because there are windows between that raised space and the rec pool as well. Uh, let's see, you'll also notice that uh, with this flexible seating, it allows not only uh, chairs and tables, but could be additional chairs, or it could be places for groups of kids. It could be used for any number of things, depending on how Park and Rec decides to operate that space. And there you can see a three-dimensional view, looking at how the spectator seats can oversee that, uh, that competition pool and the glass that allows them to look back into the rec pool and see what's going on in both spaces from the same adjacent space. And here is the first of three uh, 3D renderings that we have today. Uh, you can see the splash ground in the foreground, and then there's some uh, seating area for uh, the sun deck. And you'll notice that this is a little bit different than the previous concept. That one was fairly uh, square and sharp corners, whereas this one is much more of a curvy kind of feel to it. Uh, what we're trying to do with this is give it a little more of a special, unique look to an aquatic center. And uh, this seemed to really fit the bill for what that goal was. 
There you can see another view. This is the view of the front entrance that I talked about uh, briefly earlier. Uh, this is where the front doors sit. And as you come into the facility, you'll be right in the center of everything you'll need to have access to. And this is the third view. This is more from the side of Western Avenue. Uh, you'll notice that there is the secondary entrance for when there is an event, uh, for when that occasionally happens. And then on the right side is the lap pool uh, structure. On the left side is the front lobby that you see here, and the concession stand is right about there. Now, one thing we heard quite a bit about uh, from the uh, from the citizen committee was making sure that we have excellent deck drainage. Now, you'll notice as I went through the floor plan, we have linear deck drains. Uh, we've heard from a lot of people that those are the most effective at making sure we have a good deck drainage so we won't have puddling on the floor and things like that because safety is paramount with, uh, with park and rec. And as I get ready to turn it over to Chad, um, I want to let you recognize that uh, the parking that's currently shown for Spellerberg Park for this facility <coughs> is 204 spaces. Uh, previously, if you've been in that curved parking lot, there were 75 spaces. So we're increasing that pretty significantly, and this is designed to meet every bit of the daily load and then some. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Chad, and you can continue. Go ahead, Chad. Hi, I'm uh, Chad Cocker with Convoats here in Sioux Falls, and uh, we're responsible for siting the building on the, uh, in the park site and also the parking lot and park layout design. Um, I've got a pointer here. You know, Sean, you know, walk us through the building. Just for reference, 26th Street is at the top of the sheet here. 22nd, 26th Street's at the bottom. Grill 26 is on 26th Street, you should know that. And then 24th Street is, is right here in the middle. And as you can see, we are um, aligning the parking lot entrance, realigning it from what's there existing to line up with 24th Street. Um, as Sean mentioned, the parking lot is uh, is located here. It's very compact and efficient to try to preserve as much green space as possible on the site. The building front entrance is where the green dot is. The patio space will show an enlargement just to the south. And then the swim meet entrance is off to the east. Um, we'll go through the park uh, renovation quickly. Um, basically everything on the park site all the equipment, the shelter, is all being replaced. Uh, new park equi uh, play equipment, a uh, new larger shelter with lighting and outlets, uh, a new restroom facility, a small, it's a 30 foot by 30 foot single hoop basketball court, so kind of like the size of a, of a driveway, a residential driveway size court. A, one new sand volleyball court, it's um, new and improved, and also two tennis courts. As you recall, there's, there's, there were three on the site before. We're replacing it with two because the uh, tennis lessons that were happening at, at this park have been relocated to Laurel Oaks. So this will be more of a smaller use type tennis facility. Um, an enlargement around the building. Again, the, the front entrance to the south. The uh, patio space spray park area that Sean showed us. Then another patio space off to the side. Now, these patio spaces are fenced in. So you have to go through the building to, to be able to use those facilities. The only gates that'll, that'll be out there will be for maintenance purposes. Um, so it will not be open, you know, obviously after hours, we'll be able to get in there. And those are buffered with some landscape plantings between the parking lots, so you have a nice atmosphere when you're sitting out there. Um, again, the parking lot service area for trash, electrical, mechanical, and chemical deliveries. Now, for reference, this service area is about 12 feet lower than the tennis court. Because as Sean mentioned, this building is getting built into the side hill. We're building the floor of the, of the building roughly about where the pool was before elevation wise. So as we work our way north, we're constructing that into the hill so that the uh, visual impact is less when you're in the park space. So up here. 
Um, the white represents sidewalks, so there will still be a north-south sidewalk through the park. We'll be maintaining the connection to the VA, so the VA will have access along this sidewalk with crossings through the parking lot to get to the pool site. We also have strong connections here and here to the crosswalk and the public sidewalk, knowing that we'll get a lot of kids that are walking and biking here, especially in the summertime. Um, there's, there's really no improvements or changes, we'll say, to the south. The sledding hill stays as is. The existing detention uh, from stormwater stays unchanged. Um, and then as you can see, this parking lot spaces down here will also be able to serve that, that snow hill use in the wintertime. Um, that's a quick summary of what we're proposing on the site. We're going to take a question. Well, I think, yeah, yeah, we will. Um, Chad, if you could speak to that uh, existing detention to the west. I know we heard a lot sure. of feedback from the neighborhood. Um, yeah, there's an existing detention facility off between the, the proposed building and the VA that that, that capacity has to stay in order to meet um, stormwater requirements, but we are regrading that so it has better slope. It drains from the south part of the pond and then it gets further south to the pipe. So it is being graded so it has slope so we can get the water to move out of that area and just sit there. Thanks. Yeah, um, Tony with Sioux Falls Construction. Um, we've heard a little bit about the design today, and I just wanted to take a little bit of time to tell you how this in, how this affects the neighborhood, what kind of impact is going to happen for the next couple of years, when we're going to start, when it's going to be done, where are some big milestones and activity, when does the excitement start? Um, on the main, thank you, John. Main site plan here, there's three things I want to touch on. There's the construction of the building, there's a construction of the site, and then there's construction of the park. Uh, where, as uh, Chad mentioned, I just want to start down on the snow, on the sledding hills area. As of this time, there is some parking that has already exists for the sledding hills. That we're planning on keeping 20 to 30 stalls of that parking stall, parking lot, down on the bottom on the south side of the project during construction so that we can uh, access the sledding hill <coughs> all winter long. You will see you will you will see some uh, activity starting here in April. One of the first things we're going to do is put a construction fence around the project site, uh, start securing it for safety, um, uh, other measures like that. That construction fence will start on the south side of the parking lot, move all the way around the parking lot, and then run just on the inside of this existing sidewalk that runs all the way along the west side of the property. Therefore, this sidewalk <coughs> will be also accessible throughout the uh, winter and summer of uh, 2015. So the, in April, um, after we get the job site secured, you're going to see us coming in and you're going to see some site work starting. The first thing we're going to do is address this building footprint. We talked about the building and where it's located and, and some of the advantages of putting it into the side of the hill. That's what we'll see first. A lot of dirt work, a lot of movement that's going to happen in May, late April. Um, start clearing that site. You'll see um, all the trees that, that Chad has put back into the, the project. Uh, it's very important to us that we made sure we put as many trees back in as we took out. So we will see some trees coming down right away when the, when the site starts, but there's been a great effort to see to put um, all those back in place. Large excavation here. Traffic, traffic for the project. Most all the traffic you're gonna see on the project is gonna be on Western Avenue. We don't have any reason to be on 26 and we access in from the south. There will be some stuff I'll talk a little bit later about what 22nd will look like. But most of our access will be using the permanent access that we will be designing for the parking lot. Also along with grading this, 
we're going to come in here and raid that parking lot right away. That gives us an area to uh, lay down materials, to bring materials in, to unload materials, to um, really feed the project so that we do not disturb traffic. There'll be some excess trucks coming in and out, but nothing's getting stopped on the street. Everything's covered in the project. There will be some during the project in July-ish is where we're coming in with the utilities. There'll be some disruption. disruption. We're going to cut the street open in July, and uh, we'll have that street back open the very next day. So those those things have been thought through so that we don't impact the, uh, the flow of the traffic through, through the project. We're going to see things on the building site such as concrete foundations starting in June. And the, the goal is to get the shell, the building shell, which is a masonry CMU structure, up this year so it's closed by Christmas time. So by Christmas time you're going to see a structure there. You're going to see a whole structure of what this thing's going to start looking like. Then over the next year after that, or actually uh, six months, we're going to start the interior work, the pool, some of the aquatic supporting equipment. That comes in in the following season. Total project completion completed the fall of 2016. What I did talk about here is some of the park amenities that we're upgrading and replacing. There will be a construction fence along the north side of the building right away, but that leaves this park accessible all summer all the way through next winter. Next spring, we come in here and we take advantage of redoing the park amenities in the spring of 2016 for a completion date to turn the whole project over to the fall. Of the year. Um, uh, other disruptions, there might be some questions on how late are we working? Is it going to be noisy? Or noisy? Is it going to start early in the morning? Typical hours. We don't we don't see us bringing in a lot of floodlights bringing this building up. It's typical hours, working days, starting of when the sun comes up and when we get there in the morning around seven o'clock till about five thirty six o'clock at night. You're going to see the activity. So when the days get shorter in the in the uh, the winter time, so do the working days lighting up the site other than safety precautions as far as safety lighting in the parking lot, things like that, but we're not working around the clock to get it done. There's a, we don't see the need for anything like that. Um, loud noise, uh, it is a masonry structure we talked about. Uh, a lot of labor intensive structure, masons, uh, many masons on the site stacked up, not a lot of um, uh, large equipment other than a crane that's going to come in to set some of the big members, but mostly uh, daily production that we don't see disturbing the, the area. So that takes us through the construction portion. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Well, I think uh, that's kind of the primary piece of our presentation. We wanted to give there plenty of time today for lots of questions and some opportunity for some answers. Uh, we have um, park and rec folks here. You heard Don already, and we have city people here. We have, uh, I represent kind of the designer team. Uh, Tony represents the construction manager. So we'd love to answer any questions you might have about uh, what happens or why this, yes. Well, we've been asking for well over a year and a half about the quick claim deed and and the memorandum of understanding that we don't seem to be able to get an answer on. And I'd like to ask the you know, Kendra or Don, you know, if the city attorney has actually gotten anything in paper or we're just still looking at a little scratch pad idea that, you know, we don't have any idea what's going on. So well, uh, yeah, obviously uh, throughout this entire process we've met on a regular basis with the VA uh, to keep them abreast of what's going on. Uh, we reviewed that uh, uh, quick claim deed and the language in that quick claim deed uh, to make sure that we were in compliance with that. And then uh, I would also tell you that uh, the city attorney's office has been in contact with the VA 
and we will have uh, some forms of written agreements uh, on uh, Spellerberg and the use of Spellerberg for the contented purpose <coughs> for this uh, project. So as of right now, there's not a written agreement uh, in place, but I know uh, they're working on one. So are you planning to have that before the ground is open, or are we going to wait until the, gr the actual grand opening to have the information, and then the VA says, well, you've created a problem, now it's time to shut the place down, or, you know, we, we don't have any idea, and, you know, the citizens of Sioux Falls are putting out, you know, now $25 million for this facility, and we still don't have any kind of an answer, and we should have had an answer by now. I mean, that, that, that's just common sense. We should have had an answer, you know, that this is very simple. What, what I can tell you is that we, we do have, we have been a regular con contract. That, with but that's still, not, that's still not any kind of an answer. Well, I, I guess the answer as far as, as of right now, we don't have an agreement in place, but we are working on it. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Mine is regarding... Oh, stand up? Oh. <laughs> well, sort of like you hear you. Well. Um, mine basically pertains to parking, like when the um, contractors are there and that. Are you all planning on parking in the, um, the um, Celebrate site That's and not in the park area, not in the neighborhood? That's a great question. Uh, one, of the, one of the strategies we have to, to build this parking lot is for all construction parking. So what happens if they start parking in the neighborhood? Do we contact you? Yes, you do. Okay. That, that, that part of any project, uh, working either on a campus or in a, in a neighborhood such as this, is to control our own parking. To make sure that we have that under control and to provide a plan for our workers, and that's been done inside of our construction paths. Okay, because I own property over there on 24th and Western, and we are all already contending with um, Park Ridge in the front of our place. So if we were to have, you know, contractors over there, whatever, construction guys sitting over there too, yeah. that's not going to make it easy. I, I can tell you as is that construction workers like to park as close as they possibly can. <laughs> and so when we provide them that space, I'm sure that that, that would be easily managed. And I'm sorry, I do have one <laughs> question. Um, I see it as it's equaling up to 24th Street. Is there going to be a light there so it's going to be accessible for people to walk across 24th Street? Because we all know everybody's not going to go to 26th Street or 22nd Street and walk across at the light. Good question. And I think Heath Hoffkeeser has been looking at this. Yeah. Kendra, do you yeah. want to yeah. address it? So the, I'm with the city. Um, so what we've asked our traffic engineers is to take a look at that and to make sure that because we know that it's going to be a pedestrian walk, and that's where we want people to cross, to, to, to analyze that. So we don't have an answer today, but we're certainly looking at what we need to do to make sure that we can um, keep traffic moving, but also be as pedestrian friendly as possible. So that's a good question we're following up. And you correctly noticed that uh, the drive is lined up with 24th Street, mm -hmm. which has commonly been referred to as the safest type of intersection that doesn't have an offset of some sort. And so that's why they are aligned. Good question. Other questions? Yes. In the design of the exterior of the building, was consideration given to how the indoor aquatic center would meld into the neighborhood, particularly with the VA standing so close and having a very different architectural style? Uh, that was considered. Uh, good question. The question, if, no, if not everybody heard it, was, was there consideration into the neighborhood and specifically the VA in its architectural style? Uh, there was some early look at a potential to try and emulate the VA. It didn't really fit with the style of building that this wanted to be. An aquatic center is very different from a veterans administration administration type building. So the style didn't fit the actual form that was meant to be inside the building. And so this most recent version is more in keeping with an aquatic center kind of feel. Uh, Park and Rec felt in the city felt it was really important that this facility feel like an aquatic center and not some other type of building that didn't really match up with what its mission was about. Good question. 
Okay. Other questions? I was just wondering, will that uh, stone work that's on that, will that be the same color of, of brick that the VA center is at? Uh, the question was, is the type of stonework that's shown uh, going to match up with the VA? Uh, those colors haven't been finally determined. I think what you might be interpreting as stone might be here, uh, which are these lighter areas. Uh, well, and right those place. are actually a different color of brick as currently shown. So there will be some uh, similarities in probably the way that the different colors relate to each other, but it is not directly intended to emulate the VA. Just be complementary to it. Other questions? Yes. John could probably answer this. Where are we at with naming rights? I do like the idea of Veterans Memorial and that a fairly cool but it's not going to be called the indoor aquatic center. Is there a naming rights or where are we at on that? <laughs> yeah, we're uh, we certainly hope there is a, a special name attached to it. Uh, we currently uh, are working with Legends Global Sales to uh, sell the title naming rights sponsor on the building itself. Uh, and so that's the, the overall name, like the Danny Sanford Career Center. We're working on that same kind of naming right opportunity for the indoor aquatic center. And then there will be other opportunities within the building to be able to sell other sponsorship opportunities. Uh, to other corporations that maybe didn't want to sign on for the, the bigger piece of it, which is the title name and sponsor. So uh, you notice we have donor name here, uh, you know, to be determined. So does that answer your question? Yes. Sanford won't have no connection with it, will he? <laughs> Hard to say. Hard to say. Other questions? Sorry, I missed the last community meeting. We talked about making sure there was enough room space parking spots. I know we have over 200 parking spots, but for church buses, daycare buses, vans, handicapped ones, do we relook at that to make sure that we've got those assigned spots that will be a little bit bigger for those vehicles getting kids in and out? There are some potential spaces for that kind of thing. We have not defined which ones that would be. Uh, we did verify that the turning radiuses, and I think Ed probably wants to speak that too, that uh, to make sure that they can get around no, the parking no. lot. They're not, they're not designated specifically for buses, but we really see the way it would operate is we drop off here, you pull around, you park in these outermost spaces with the bus, right, and then recirculate back to the bus. So that they're not designated as bus only, so like during a weekend, they could still off the vehicles. But remember when we were talking about that, the daycares can't use the drop off because they're not overstaffed oh, with their vehicle, right. so they've got to take the kids wherever yeah. they can park. And then I think we kind of left off is, is not knowing what that need is, but if we can assign some of the close response and reserve the daycare vans, they can fit in a normal size right. parking spot. I just wanted to make sure that there was enough spots in there that they're not going to get stuck parking on the side street and have to walk the Right, no, I think that's definitely an operation. I will know what that quantity is. Perfect. Other questions? Mine's on the traffic flow expectations. Uh, mainly during during construction thereafter, but um, what sort of timeline is there? You know, excavating it, you said it was a, a big undertaking, but you know, uh, what sort of semi-track truck trailers, or how long are we going to experience that? Uh, once, once the activity starts in uh, late April, early May, you're going you're gonna to see trucking. This is going to take a couple of weeks of trucking, and they're going to be um, consistent with them over here south exit on the 26. Uh, that trucking will be consistent all the way through May for the excavation. At that time, you're going to see the traffic change from uh, dirt work trucking traffic to periodically traffic of the concrete guys coming in, concrete trucks coming in, and concrete trucks. Uh, the fours that you see on a project like this all the way through the summer are going to be um, scheduled fours three days a week. So you would see five, six trucks that day come in of their concrete and need. It's not a huge concrete job where there are lines and lines of trucks coming in, but you will have excess trucks of um, 
three, four, five trucks a day that'll come in at different periodic times, typically an hour apart, so they aren't lined up either. So there will be that traffic that is introduced to the project throughout uh, this summer. I think it's also important to remember that uh, the city has some pretty stringent requirements about what the trucks can track in and track out, more importantly, of the site. And so, uh, Tony, maybe you want to speak to kind of that clean out area that you have to maintain to make sure that you're protecting those streets. Sure. One, one of the strategies we have is a traffic uh, uh, station that's going to be uh, installed right at this uh, inter or, uh, our approach here. And what that does is that keeps the dirt debris inside the site. It's, it's rubble that, that cleans the tires off before they get it out into the street. Also, that strategy we talked about of building the gravel parking lot first right away, not wait until the spring, really controls a lot of the debris that will get drug out in the road. And any debris that gets drug out in the road, we have uh, uh, street sweepers of our own that pick that up on a daily basis. We don't rely on um, other means to do that as part of the construction activities. But I think as far as the traffic, uh, there is traffic that is increased during the day but it's not a project that is um, lined up with that kind of traffic. <laughs> 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 well, let's see, let's go here. So a lot of traffic. Yeah. 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 And the width of the road here is the same as it is here. There's a turn lane right here. So we're hopeful that we can just do it with paint, but we still need to figure out the details. Good. Good question. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering about the official entry and exit. I mean, is it just going to be just one entry, one exit for each, for the facility? Do you want to speak to the building? building? Yeah, for the building, excuse me. Oh, the building. I thought yeah, or, I mean, no, excuse me, right this. into the parking lot. Or, or mm -hmm. Right, there's one entrance and exit into the, into the parking lot. There is a dedicated right turn lane, and then there's a, a straight slash left turn lane, so we do have those separated with some staffing distance. So the help you manage that traffic out. As far as the building, there are two primary entrances, uh, the one being the very front entrance, the second one being the one that I uh, outlined earlier as the entrance for the special events. And then there are many, many ex uh, exits out of the building. Uh, this building has <coughs> more exits than required by code, which we always have to at least meet the code, and we're making sure that we do that. Yes. Northwest corner of the map, everything above, what are all of those little buildings, all of that stuff in there? Yep. The stuff here. Yeah, name those, please. Sure. Tennis Sports. court. Chad, do that up here. The sand volleyball court. So how far up the hill is that? Up the hill as far as, right now the sand volleyball court sits on top of Yes, the is that right? And then you're not court? moving that then? So you're up on the hill now. Right, these are up on the hill. Yeah. The tennis court, so the, the existing easternmost volleyball courts here, the western one is over here. So we're building over that, replacing that with the tennis court. So this is all up on top of the hill, and there's actually a retaining wall on the south and the west side of this tennis court. So well, actually, up. So all the picnic area is going to disappear then. Well, the picnic area is over here. Well, the picnic area comes all the way down that hill. There's there's tables all over that area, and there, are, there won't be any. You'll just build it, cut it down, and build over. So it's, it's right. It is more condensed. How many trees are you cutting down? We are we are right about 90. We're losing and replacing, and they're not all. There's a lot of variation. Some of them are are new that could be relocated. Some of them are fairly poor condition, and then there's there's some that are still nice. They're not all. Beautiful. I walk it every day. They're gorgeous. So we're saving every single one that we can, and including we made extra special care to save this evergreen border on the west. I know that's really important. 
And we worked around we worked around the park layout, picking the, the best existing trees so we can save those. So we designed this intentionally to save the really nice maples, especially in there. Yeah, Chad makes a good point there that you see the ones that are a little bolder around that are close to the building. Those are the new trees. All of these, except for just a handful of these, are existing trees. So much of what you see, especially on that north side, is existing growth that are the higher quality trees to remain. How big of trees are you bringing in? Very, between uh, two and three inch. So it's going to be quite a few years before we get any shade off of yeah. them, or right? But that's you know an optimum size that if you have an impact right away. But if you bring in something really big, they really stunts their growth and they're slow to establish. We're trying to hit that optimum mark of size. I think we had a question back here. Uh, my name is Tom Munster, and I've followed this issue for a while. And I just want to say I think this is a really impressive plan. Uh, and I want to compliment the Parks Department and the Focus Committee for really putting in the time and effort here because I think it's a nice looking building. Uh, I also think from what I can see, the landscaping uh, looks nice. I like the way the building is oriented. Uh, I do have just a couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, and I may have missed this first part, but it relates to traffic flow. Uh, what about parking for bicycles and you know people that may not be driving cars? Uh, has there been any consideration for extra bike racks or some way that we could get in there yeah, on bicycles? The middle one maybe sure. We know that that's really important, especially with you know kids we're going to see. So we have this plaza space that's right up here. It's kind of kind of fuzzy, but as part of that, we have I want to say it's it's forty four park, bike parking spots. As part of that is permanent bike spots, and then also. In addition, I believe seven up by the playground, so there are permanent bike spots as part of the plan. They're integrated into the plaza, so they feel like they belong and not back. That's great to hear. The second part of that question that I have is uh, really related to parking and special events. I know we've talked about holding swim meets in this facility, and we've made accommodations for that with a great viewing platform. Uh, and with 204 spots, that's certainly great for maybe the average uh, daily load and whatnot. But for those couple times a year when we do those special events, how, how do you envision it working in terms of bringing lots of people in for a swim meet? Or would there be buses that would transport people from other lots around the city, or how, how would we make provisions to, to get lots and lots of people in and out of this facility? Yeah, I think uh, uh, certainly something we talked all along is that if we had a special event, we'd want to try to really look at shuttling people back and forth. And so whether that's a satellite location, for example, at Sherman Park or something like that, uh, potentially could be shuttling people back and forth. I think something we'll want to work with the meet organizers, uh, special event organizers, to determine how many people we think we're going to have uh, showing up. And then also talk about how they schedule the meet so that they can schedule it so that we can try to skip, stagger the start time so we don't have everybody there all at once. And so it'll be a combination of a variety of factors, I think, Tom, to really try to address that. But we are committed to making sure that through our special events process that we uh, can accommodate the parking demands that the swim meet, like you mentioned, and create. I think a lot of the things that you'll see are the kind of the dual meets or some of the uh, you know, smaller number of team type meets. But you know, if we're successful in bidding on some of those, then certainly we've got to make those accommodations to, to accommodate the parking needs. Yes. So I was wondering regarding the, I noticed the lap pool is called a competition pool and the other one is called a recreation pool. Could you talk, this is more on the operations end of it once it's up, could you talk a little more about access to the pools for lap swimming if you're not on a team? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> as Sean mentioned in the recreational pool, we, we do have three 60 foot lap lanes, uh, much like I think Sanford Wallace has, uh, so that would be available on, on, all the time. Uh, but they also, uh, I don't know if Sean mentioned or not, but we have 21 lap lanes that can go uh, the 25 yard length on the 50 meter pool. These are the three lap lanes that Don was talking about. Yeah, and then the, we can swim the, the short way, which is 25 yards, or we can have the bulkheads uh, so that we can have uh, you know, 10 25 yard lanes on one side, 10 25 yard lanes on the other side, 
and so there'd be a lots of opportunity for lap swimming. Um, we really envision that uh, almost always there will be lap lanes available in the 50 meter uh, pool. Uh, swim meet might be an exception to that, where you know the rec pool and lap lanes may be the only ones that are available for use. Uh, but uh, as Tom had mentioned, there's probably a couple times a year where we'll see that happen. But the goal is, is if there is a meet in the 50 meter competition side, uh, that that recreational side will be open and available for the general public to use that. Yes. Yeah, earlier in the discussions, there was talk about uh, veterans from the VA utilizing this pool, etc. And at that time, they talked about different how they would have different access to it. But I don't really see a sidewalk area there or a road or they take the picks up. It's tough with the sidewalk on a wheelchair because you got the up. It's not played. Otherwise, they'd have to get in a van and go all the way around 22nd or 26th. Well, we. We, at one really, really early on, we, sh we showed some options to the city group with vehicle access between the two sites, and then we said that that was not something that we wanted to explore. But we do have an eight foot wide sidewalk from here. And then, as you, as you mentioned, it does cross the parking lot, but there are curb ramps there, so you can get a wheelchair through that, and then it goes to the front entrance. This is eight foot wide the entire way, so that golf carts, if that was an operational use, could make that true. That, that is a strong priority to have that VA. In this case, it's a vestry. You have a VA connection. Yes. How deep are the lap lanes in the alternate pool when there's a meet or something going on? What are you talking about? Um, the rec pool. The rec pool. In the rec pool, there are three and a half feet deep. That's all. And what are you going to do with this presentation, kids? Well, you can you can also uh, swim laps in three and a half feet. That's deep enough for a flip turn. It is not deep enough to dive into, which is not recommended in the rec pool anyway. But it is deep enough to do a flip turn at both ends. So three and a half feet is all that's going to be there. Yes, that's correct. You want to talk about the depths on the other pool when the two Yes. Sure. Um, <coughs> Uh, at the 50 meter, it varies from, I think it's four feet deep at this end down to 13 feet deep at the deep end. Uh, so it uh, has quite a variance depending on what the function and use uh, of those spaces is. As was just discussed back here, these are three and a half feet deep, as is this whole area, including the current channels, all three and a half feet. And then this area varies down to five feet at the deep end of that pool as well. It's made for people who float, not for vertical floaters. What's that? It's made for people who float, or not for vertical floaters. Well, it's made for as multifunctional use as possible. That's what the real big goal of the city was throughout all of these pool designs. And if I remember right, from the community meeting, with three and a half foot going on the side over where the water slide is, where the laps could be, that can also be used for like water aerobics or different types of classes. So we can't have it too deep there. But in the other pool, we were able to take it to the five foot deep. So it, it varied based on height and they're exercising for other types of the floating to be able to do those types of aerobics. Um, with water belts and things, correct? Well stated, exactly. Uh, the intent was to make everything as multifunctional as possible. Okay. Other questions? Do we have the chairs, I forgot, I'm sorry, that will help the kids in the wheelchair or adults in wheelchairs to get into the pools? Uh, that's an operational thing. I think you guys were talking about something like that. The less, yeah. Oh yes. The lifts are the chairs. Yep. Do we have a total of five lifts, four lifts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's four or five. I forget the exact three, number. Three to fifty. Okay. Perfect. Well, this is the website uh, that there is a lot of information about this project, um, and. Uh, 
the presentation or parts of this that you've seen today, I think, are planning to be posted here if you want to review any of this at a later date. Uh, for those of you in the media, I did bring a few uh, flash drives of uh, excerpts from what you just saw today in case you want to use any of that uh, with any of your uh, product. Um, and with that done, did you want to do any wrap-up? Yeah, I would just uh, appreciate you coming out today. Uh, we're really excited about the project. Uh, we've been talking about building for, for, for a very long time. And we're really excited to be able to offer it up to the community. Uh, I know we have some part four members here, and I know that they're working very hard on that as well. So uh, you too, thanks. Thanks for being here. appreciate that. Uh, we will have, uh, as uh, construction progresses, we will have periodic meetings. Uh, we're talking about trying to get some type of communication, communication out to the neighborhood to keep you abreast of what's going on. I know just working with Tori and Chad and, and Sean, if you have questions or you have uh, concerns, uh, by all means let the project team know and certainly want to address them. I know there's going to be a little, a little construction fatigue, I'm, I'm sure, as part of this overall project, but uh, I think you can see from the images it's going to be beautiful when it's done. And we think uh, the community is going to really appreciate it. So, again, thank you uh, for coming tonight. And again, if you have any other questions, just let us know. Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. Come on, let's go. Come on.